So this morning, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. And as you're turning there, let me recognize uh, we've got our campus crusade uh, crusaders back in again this year. Isaac, um, I see you back there in the back. You've got 104 students this year, 25 campus ministers, and you guys are here for what, two weeks? And we're glad to have all them. That's what that whole group of excited young folks back there. We're glad y'all are here. Now, how many of you go to Alabama? Okay, how many of you go to... Okay, are, does anybody, is anybody from Auburn in the group? You guys are a little a bit out, outnumbered. Okay, I could go somewhere with this, but I better leave it alone. How many uh, Mississippi? Arkansas. No Arkansas guys this year. How about LSU? Georgia. All right. Georgia Tech. All right. There's always one of them. Tennessee. All right. I'm glad they could find a Christian in Tennessee. I'm sorry. It just slipped. I'm teasing. There's a lot of great Tennessee folks. A lot of great Tennessee folks. Okay, did I miss anybody out of the out of the South? Okay, where are you from? Nebraska. Okay, are you down with this group too? Wow, man, the the stretch is really going. Where else? South Carolina, North Carolina, Rhode Island. Well, I'm impressed to have a corn husker. That that this time of the year to to have a corn husker. California, which which school? USC. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Absolutely amazing. We're really glad y'all are here this morning. Well, this morning I'd planned to preach out of the Old Testament, but I'm going to shift that to next week. I was going to be in the book of Second Chronicles, but as I was working through, I, I was just moved that, well, every time I started my message, I, I, I did it three times before I finally got it done. And, and what really got me this week was when one of the most powerful offices in all the world comes out and says it is in support of homosexual marriage. And I thought about that. Here the President of the United States is really uh, endorsing Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah. But a little bit beyond that, um, I noticed on Facebook there was a man that I have known for a lot of years that wrote on there praising Obama for his decision, and then he tagged it with an amen. Well, the amen got me, and so I responded because I've known this guy ever since he was a teenager in the youth group at the first church I ever pastored. And what I discovered this week in my conversation, although I prayed and said, God, I want, to, I want you to, to move in me to have grace. I want you to move in me to have mercy, and uh, I want you to move in me to be, a, uh, to be wise in the words that I say. This is what I found out is I'm not only a bigot, but I'm a Southern Baptist bigot. So I responded, and you know, I, I talked about how sin is sin. It doesn't matter what the sin is, but when we choose to practice sin and go in a way that, uh, that goes contrary to God, to go and, and do the things that God hated so much that Christ died for, but he loved us so much he wanted to give us life. When we choose to do that, we're just totally dissing God, and we're, we're totally disregarding God. We're show, totally showing no respect for God whatsoever. And I was thinking about how the home is today, because, you know, our home life has changed so much in, in, our, in our nation. We're a nation that was founded upon the standard of the Judeo-Christian ethic. And being founded on that Judeo-Christian ethic, our laws are based upon the Ten Commandments. You know, the Big Ten that God gave us, the things that we should not do and the things that we should do in honoring Him and honoring our mother and honoring our father. And it becomes important, if we're going to continue and be blessed as a nation, that we obey God at every point. The reason our nation has been blessed is because we have been a nation under God. We have been a nation that has submitted to God. We have been a nation that has sought to honor God in obedience to those big th ten, ten things that He has given us. But in the day that we begin to neglect and in the day that we begin to diss will be the day in which we see the hand of God being removed 
off the most blessed nation that has ever existed on this planet in all of human history. And so the Apostle Paul writes to this young man in the faith, this young man named Timothy. Timothy was a a young minister. He was a young pastor. And this is what Paul told him in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy, for I am mindful of the sincere faith within you which was first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm sure that is in you as well. And then in chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, he says, You, however, continue in the things that you've learned to become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Why is that? Because you look at verse 12 right above that. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. We live in a day and we live in an age when the imposters have invaded and they have gone from bad to worse. We live in a day when every institution as we know it has come under attack. The institution of the church is under attack. The institution of government is under attack. And the institution of the family is under attack. Now we have to understand where the family came from. In the Garden of Eden, before evil had ever touched the world, God made man and he made woman. And he blessed them and he told them to go and to be fruitful and to multiply. And he told them to walk in obedience before him. And man and woman lived that way for a short while, and then they dissed God, and and they blew it, and they walked in disobedience, and sin came into the world. And ever since that time, the downfall of man has been continuous. It's been continuous. And we live in a nation that was founded upon godly principle. We live in a nation that was founded upon godly law. We live in a nation that was founded as, as a place of religious freedom so as to honor God. And so it's important that we recognize where these attacks come from. They come from the evil one. Our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against uh, you know these, uh, these, uh, these attacks that come in this present age in which we live. The Bible tells us as we approach the end times that things will get worse and worse and worse. All kinds of things rise up. Sons will rise up against their fathers, and son, fathers will turn against their sons. They'll call evil good and good evil. And all kinds of things go on. And so it's important that we be rooted and that we be grounded and that we be founded in faith that is pure and that is sincere and is based upon a conviction of who we are in relationship to God. Now Paul talks about Timothy and he says, you know, there's not anybody like Timothy when he writes to the Philippians. You know, he's like-minded. He's like me. He's like-minded. There's no one else like Timothy that I have. And, and, and there's something about Timothy that, that made him shine in the, in the life of Paul. And he's described as having, an, having a faith that is a sincere faith. It's something that's real to him. It's not something that he wears on his shoulder on Sunday. It's not something that he has to get ahead with a certain group that maybe goes to church. But it's something that's real. It's something that's sincere to him. And Paul says, I notice that this faith first existed in your grandmother Lois. And I notice that it first existed in your, in your mother Eunice. 
And, and so when Paul's talking about this kind of faith, he's talking about the kind of faith upon which we build our family. He's talking about the kind of faith upon which we build the church. He's talking about the faith that we build our individual lives upon. Now, that kind of faith that Paul is talking about here in this scripture is, first of all, it is a convicting faith. It's a convicting faith. Paul writes Timothy in chapter 1, verse 5, he says, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm sure that it is in you as well. Now, when you look at Acts chapter 16 and 2 Timothy uh, 1 and 2 Timothy 3, you know, it, it makes it plain that these two women, Lois and Eunice, enjoyed a faith in God through the Lord Jesus Christ that was both scriptural and saving. Now, grab a hold of this. There are times when people think they've got a faith, and that faith is not really based upon what the Scripture has to say. Sometimes, you know, they've got a faith, and, and, uh, and, and I'll say, well, do you know Christ Jesus is your Lord and Savior? And they'll say, I do. And I'll say, well, well, tell me about that faith experience. And that faith experience is based upon, well, I was born into a Christian family. Or that ba- faith experience is, I am a good person. Or that faith experience says, well, I, I just want to be a part of this church. We well, see, that's not a scriptural faith experience. A scriptural faith experience is an experience where you or I come and we meet the living Lord Jesus Christ. He infiltrates us, so to speak. He brings us to a place where we recognize Him as being the Son of God. We recognize that everything that has ever been said about Jesus Christ through the Bible, are our true statements. That's the kind of a scriptural faith that I'm talking about. And that kind of a scriptural faith comes to a place where it looks to the Lord Jesus Christ and it accepts Him as both Lord and Savior. Now, this kind of a scriptural faith for Eunice and for Lois came because they believed in something that God had given. The Scripture tells us here in 315 that they believed and they knew the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom and lead to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You know, they could have never taught these things to Timothy had they not known them, had they not been real to them. Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 10, verse number 17, and he said, So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And so above tradition and above, you know, the, the fictional writings of their day, Lois and Eunice taught Timothy the Scripture. And so the Bible tells us something about this Scripture in verse number 16 of our text. It says all Scripture. It doesn't just say some of the Scripture, but it says all Scripture. All Scripture is inspired by God. Now, what does that mean? It means that His Word, what we have, you know, in the covers of our Bibles. And Now, understand something. We're not exalting the Word to such a place that we worship the Word, but we do revere it. And the Bible tells us that all Scripture is inspired by God. Now, this is what it means. It means that in that original text, that God breathed those words into those writers who would pen what God had to say to man. So it's all inspired of God. Therefore, it's uh, it's trustworthy. It's truth without any mixture of error. And so God goes on and He tells us here in His Word, because He's breathed it, that it's profitable. It's profitable to be taught. It's profitable for reproof. It's profitable for correction and for training in what? In righteousness. So Timothy had a faith that was passed on to him that was a scriptural faith. But not only as a matter of convictional faith was it a scriptural faith, but it was also savingly sure. It was certain. Paul writes and said, The sacred writings which are able to give you salvation through faith, which is in Christ. Now, Timothy's mother and grandmother were introduced to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ by uh, Paul on his second missionary journey. And Eunice is here described as a Jewish woman who believed. She's a Jewish woman who believed. Now, it's important that you grab a hold of of, uh, the the meaning of, of to believe. Okay, Now remember, they are very familiar with Scripture. They're very familiar with the Word of God. Okay, So they've studied it. They're Jews. They've studied it. And when they're introduced to Jesus Christ as being the Messiah, with their scriptural background, 
It's a scriptural faith, remember? It comes to a place that their head connects with their heart, the longest distance in the universe. And their heart believes. It's all tied in there. And that word believe carries on with it the idea of loving more than anything else. And so when a person believes, they, they're willing to leave everything in order to, to have Jesus Christ. That's why you see in revival meetings people unafraid to get up and walk down in front of thousands like at the old Billy Graham crusade to say, I want to follow Jesus. It's why, you know, people who believe are, are willing to forsake their very lives at times so as to follow after Jesus Christ. I remember my mother telling her testimony. My mother was born a long, long time ago, and she's been in heaven for 21 uh, years, I think it is. But I remember her talking about the night she came to know Jesus Christ as her Savior and Lord. Now, understand, she had grown up in a day when, you know, there weren't mega churches and, and there weren't, you know, uh, churches uh, every weekend even because her daddy was a, was a uh, primitive Baptist elder. He pastored three churches at one time. And, um, and so, you know, it was from church to church. There were quarter-time churches. They met once a month. But after she married my dad, and my, my grandfather didn't even perform the marriage because she was embarrassed. They went to the Justice of the Peace. And, uh, you know, I think she was 16 years old. My dad was born in 1909. She was born in 1913. And so that makes me really young. I'm not as old as that would make me be because I got brothers that are way older, old enough to be, you know, my, my parents. But anyway, another story. The, the, the thing is, is after she married my dad, they moved up to Gainesville, Georgia. And the family was attending First Baptist Church of Gainesville. And she said one Sunday night, the Holy Spirit of God got a hold of her. And she came to the place of believing. And she had always been shy and would never want to step out in front of folks. And there was nothing that would hold her back from going to declare her belief in Jesus that night to the front of the church and talking to the pastor. See, that belief draws us out. It sets us apart. So it's a, it's a savingly sure kind of thing. So Eunice and Lois had a, had a belief that was based upon the Word of God, and it was based upon the certainty of God working in their life. And they communicated that in the second place. It was a communicated kind of faith. Paul says in verse 5, he says, I'm mindful of the sincere faith that is in you that first dwelt in your grandmother, in your mother. And in 3.14, he says, you, however, continue in the things that you've learned. You know, you live in a, in a world, Timothy, in which you find that, that um, you know, to live a godly life, you're going to be persecuted. You've found that evil men and imposters proceed from bad to worse, and, and they're, being, uh, they're deceiving, and they're being uh, deceived, and, and all this world's coming down. But there's no one, you know, then that can really communicate the deep things of God in that kind of an environment, in that kind of a world, like a mom and like a, a godly mom. You know, I, I think about that oftentimes because, dads, we certainly have our responsibility of leadership and, and we're to lead by example and we're to lead by, by inspiration and we're to call the, char the troops out and we're to charge, you know, the gates and we're to charge the hill and we're to do those kinds of things. But it's mama back there in the trenches that are building up the kids so oftentimes at home. You know, it's the mothers who make the, the deepest of impressions. When I think about that, oftentimes I'll leave early in the morning before the kids ever, you know, get going, and, and I'll get back home at night after they're already gone to bed. And through that day, my wife ha has spent that day instilling in the children. And, and, of course, you know, they range, you know, from 12 to their 20s, and they're all in school, and none of them will get done with school. I wish they would. But, you know, all that kind of stuff. But... But she's the one that instills those, those deep things and, and, and such. And, and it's to mama that they come. And, and they communicated to Timothy, you know, on a, on a personal level. It was a, it was a uh, communication by education. And he said, continue the things that you've learned. You know, from his earliest days, Timothy was taught the Scriptures. And, and, and there was a sense of duty to communicate the Word of God with Eunice and with Lois. But it came because they had been communicated to. You see, they were Jews by, 
by faith, and, and they were Jews by, by nurture. They were Jews by training, and they understood the Scripture of the Old Testament. They understood in Deuteronomy chapter 4 when it says, Give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, and do not forget the things which your eyes have seen. Make them known to your sons and make them known to your grandsons. God is talking to his people, and he said, You've seen my hand of deliverance. You've seen my hand of provision. You've seen my umbrella of protection. I have walked with you. I've opened up the seas, and I've caused the manna to fall from heaven, and I've caused the water to flow out of a rock. I have provided for you, and I have protected protected you and I've given you victory and God is reminding his people that they're not to forget and he's reminding his people that they are to remind them their children of all that he has done in their lives and so he goes on a little bit further and he talks about you know how they're to love God and and in the book of Deuteronomy it says these words in chapter 6 shall be on your heart teach them diligently to your sons and and and, and talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you go and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you know what God says? He says, Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities that you didn't build and houses full of things that you uh, uh, filled with things that you did not fill and hewn cisterns that you didn't dig and vineyards and olive trees that you didn't plant. Watch yourselves that you do not forget the Lord. And you know, wouldn't it be great if every home in America was a Christian home? Then we wouldn't have this challenge of an America, of a nation that is in the process of forgetting God. Because you see, you know, God has given us things that we've not had to really work for, has He not? He's given us a land that flows with milk and honey. He he has given us a land that has been blessed. He's given us a land that has been protected. And and so when we fail to do these things, you know, his hand of blessing begins to slip back. And so he goes a little bit further in the book of Deuteronomy. He says, Beware that your hearts are not deceived, and do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them, or the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain on your ground. And so he goes on, and he talks about the importance of impressing the words of faith upon our children. And so by the time you get to Proverbs and the wise man Solomon, you find that Solomon says, My son, observe the commandment of your father, and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. You see, fathers and mothers have been given this tremendous charge of raising up our kids. Now, oftentimes, you know, you know we've got a lot of control when they're little. You know, I, I hear, you know, young parents talk about a lot, you know, well, man, this little baby, it's a lot of work. You know, I'm, I'm changing diapers all the time. Well, these are the easy years. Sometimes you think the terrible twos are the worst years that you'll ever face with your kid. It's not true. Sometimes you think that the terrible tens, it's not true. It's the terrible fifties. No, not really. But it's the terrible, you know, teens, those 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds and, and then the 20s at times as well. And, and, and you're thinking, you know, Lord, I thought I did all I was supposed to do. I thought I was faithful and I thought I was in the Word and I thought I was employing godly principle. I thought, you know, I was trusting you and, and, and I, you know, I, they were in church with me and they've been in everything and, and, you know, I don't understand. But Solomon gives us understanding. He says in Proverbs 22, 6, he says, We're to train up a child in the way that they're to go, and even when they're old, they will not depart from it. That leaves a little bit of time here called the midlife years. That child, that greatest influence upon that child is going to be before they hit the age of 12, y'all. That's going to be the time of, of greatest influence for you parents and for you grandparents. And from 12 to 25, you as a parent and as a grandparent become the dumbest stump that's ever existed on the planet. And by the time you turn to be, you know, by the time they get to be 26, 27, 28, this is what they've they've learned. Hey, you know, my, my folks have been going to school. They're getting smarter. And they begin to identify. But there comes that time when that turn happens. But there's those in-between years, those in-between times. But here's, here's the word that, that God's given. He said, you know, bind them continually on your heart and tie them around your neck. Don't forget these things. 
And so they educated Timothy and trained him. And they also gave him a faith that was demonstrated in practical ways. He said in, in verse 14 of chapter 3, knowing from whom you've learned them. You know, Timothy had something, you know, had seen something in their lives that demonstrated the reality of their faith in Christ Jesus. And, and he had learned something. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians and when he wrote to the Colossians, these are the words he said, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord so that they won't lose heart. You know what? What Paul was instructing, he's not instructing that we never bring correction to our kids, but we never belittle them. We never tear them down. We, we never cut them down. But we build them up, and we're to look for their strengths. That's another part of training up that child. We look for their strengths so as to enhance them, so as to motivate them, so as to encourage them. And we do these things that they might not lose heart. I read about John Newton. John Newton, I don't know if you recognize that name, but he lived some pretty wasted and reckless days in his life. But he learned about prayer at his mother's knees. And sometimes when he was in danger, sometimes when he was facing a, a difficult situation, he would cry out, Oh God, help me. Oh God, deliver me. Oh God, have mercy on me. John Newton would come on to a place where he would finally come to that spot where he knew Jesus as his personal Savior and Lord, where he believed. And that belief extended and reached the gap between the head and the heart. And he quit doing the slave trade, and he quit doing the, the ships, and he came on to write that great hymn that we so know and love, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. John Wesley, the father of modern-day Methodism, had a mother who was a prayer warrior. Her name was Susanna Wesley. And I forget exactly how many kids she had, but she would have won all the roses this morning. And this is what they knew. I mean, they were in a humble home in England, and all these kids knew that when Susanna Wesley sat down in her rocker beside the, the hearth and the fire was blazing, and when that apron was pulled up and laid over her head, they knew not to come and tap her on the arm and say, Mama, can I? How many of you mothers know that? How many times do your kids come to you, Mama, can I? Mama, may I? Mama, can we? How many of y'all, y'all with me on that? And certainly, you know, these kids were trained in such a way as, so as, to not know, as, to not, as to know not what to do. So it was a faith that had been communicated. And it was a faith that had been demonstrated. And, and it was a faith then that became a faith that was commended. It was a commendable kind of faith. The Bible says, I am mindful of the sincere faith within you which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois, your mother Eunice, and I'm sure that it's in you as well. You know, some, have, some commentators have suggested that Paul stayed at Timothy's house. You know, when you stay with somebody, you learn an awful lot about them, do you not? Is that not true? Have you ever stayed with somebody and really been surprised at the things you've learned? You know, I've stayed with people, and I've, I've been surprised at the things I've learned about myself. I remember there was a time out in, uh, in, uh, when I was in seminary, I was preaching out in this small little town way out in West Texas, filling in for a friend or something. It's that revival where we saw the uh, roadrunners running in the middle of the main street, which was not paved, just red dirt. And we went to stay at this uh, rancher's house. And, and I learned a lot of things that week. And, and, and while we were staying there, they had these parrots that talked. And, 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 you know, Beverly would walk by, and the parrot would say, Hello, good morning, good looking. When I'd walk by, the parrot would go, Ha, ha. And so you learn things about yourself. I learned I don't want a parrot because they're mean. But, you know, what, what we learn is, is we learn a lot about a people. We learn a lot about a person. And, and if Paul really did stay at Timothy's home, he had a lot that he observed and a lot that he learned about Lois and about Eunice, and he saw their faith. He couldn't forget their faith. He couldn't forget their devotion that was so evident in their lives, and, and it became a lasting influence. He said, I'm mindful of that sincere faith. And I want you to know something, that the most priceless treasure you can ever have is, is not, you know, like a, a new car, and it's not, you know, some dream home on a faraway island where there's no taxes. 
But the most priceless treasure that you can ever have is faith. You know, you can lose all the stuff in this life just like that. But your most priceless treasure is faith. You know, over the last four or five years in this time of recession and depression, there have been people that have lost their fortune. But if they had faith, they've not lost that. I think it was a week and a half ago, a week and a half ago, a young lady had been kayaking on a river in Georgia, in northwest Georgia. Some of the very rivers I've, ca- I've canoed on there. And she did that homemade zip line thing, and it sliced her leg in 22 stitches. And little did they know that that slice had been invaded with a flesh-eating bacteria. And they amputated her leg at her hip the other day. You're not sure she's going to make it, although she's showing some improvement now. Some of her organs seem to be responding. And you know, even life as we know it can be snatched away in the blink of an eye. But if we have a faith that's real, and if we have a faith that's genuine, that's based upon the Scripture, and that is certain in our hearts, that connects heart and mind together, then God has given us something that can endure every storm, that can weather through any heartache, that can last through any situation until He takes us home. As I was having conversation on Facebook this week with this individual that I know, I reminded him of the sincere faith that he once exhibited in church. And I said, this is my prayer for you. My prayer is that God would bring you back. Because I knew you when. You were a teenager. I was your pastor. I knew you as you loved Jesus and as you sang songs at churches all over. I knew you as you went to this denomination's college and seminary. And I knew you when godly people in the church took up collections to send you through school. I pray that you would return to a sincere faith that you once had. But you know, that's not just my prayer for one individual, but that's my prayer for a church. That's my my prayer for for all of us, is that our faith would be that 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 flows out of the depths of who we are, that it flows out of the depths of a relationship that we have with Almighty God that it be a foundation from which we we build and we grow as a people of Christ in this place right here, that we get down to the sound and fundamental teachings of what Scripture has to say as we live in relationship to the King. And when we have that kind of a faith, it becomes a a relevant kind of faith, a a kind of faith that, that stands up and stands out. It becomes a faith that has in it the principle of life. And there's a big difference between that that has the principle of life and that which does not. Uh, A mustard seed has the principle of life within it. It's got everything within it to to have the power to, to grow and to become that magnificent tree that God designed it to be. But a pellet of dust is about the same size as a mustard seed and it has no principle of life in it at all and what an epic difference between the two and God looks at us and we're on this journey in life we're on this journey in faith we're on this journey as a church we're on this journey as a people of God and he wants us to arrive in in an epic place called heaven but to get there we've got to have an epic faith that has the principle of life And faith that has the principle of life is a faith with God in it. In other words, it says, I believe God. In other words, it it has this this fundamental platform from which it stands, as, as Steve pointed out earlier, forever God. It doesn't matter what comes and what goes. It doesn't matter how fashions change and styles come and styles go. There's one foundation that remains throughout all of eternity, forever God. Forever God. He's the one for whom we build our lives upon. He's the one who empowers us to grow. He is the one who empowers us to have a family. He's the one who empowers moms and dads and boys and girls to be a people who love Him and they're called 
after His purpose. You know, this living relevant faith that Paul talks about here was first seen in two women in this man's family. A grandmother named Lois and a mother named Eunice. Tough times. Roman rule. These were, you know, Jews that were dispersed. But they kept their feet on the ground and their prayers in heaven. And that's what God calls us to do. He calls us to keep our knees on the ground and our prayers in heaven. The journey of faith. Have you come to that place today where you can say beyond any shadow of a doubt, I truly believe upon the name of Jesus Christ. To believe means that I accept Him and I acknowledge Him, that He's God's Son and He's the world's Savior. But it connects my head and my heart to say, and I love Him so much that I'm willing to forsake all things in order to follow after Him. Have you come to that place? Or maybe you've come to a place where you believe that God is leading you to be a part of this church family and you've already known Christ. Or He's calling you to a step of obedience, maybe through the waters of baptism. Whatever it may be, we're about to sing a song of decision. And I want to invite you to come up after this prayer when we stand and sing and say, Pastor, I want to believe upon Jesus more than anything. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love and for your grace. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for godly mothers and godly dads who have passed down your word to us down through the years. Now, fathers, we respond to you. To you be the glory. To you be the honor. To you be the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.